in Namibia, an estimated 15% of couples have difficulty with fertility, according to doctors at the Cape Vintuk uh, Fertility Center. In many cultures, childless women are often stigmatized and experience discrimination. Furthermore, assisted conception services like IVF in vitro fertility um, are often inaccessible and for many unaffordable. Today on Heartbeat, we'll be joined by a gynecologist from the Rundu Private Hospital, Dr. Luganu Ndovi, and an infertility activist, as well as Merck More Than a Mother heroine, uh, Ms. Helena uh, Mutseng. Ms. Helena Mutseng. Uh, Dr. Ndovi, uh, Helena, thank you so much for joining me uh, for this discussion that we're going to have on infertility and just difficulties with conception. So to jump right into it, um, Dr. Ndovi, I'll start off with you. If you could just um, give us a definition of infertility, explain to us what it is and uh, what causes it. Right, so thank you for having me. Um, so infertility is actually defined as um, failure to conceive or failing to get pregnant. And usually we add to that definition a time frame which normally we say if a couple has been trying for more than a year then they will be classified as uh, infertile mm -hmm. but we do know that over a period of time women ability to fall pregnant declines yes uh, so the group of women that is above 35 we can't use the cutoff point of one year. Therefore, for a couple that is above 35 years of age, if they've been trying for more than six months, then they would be classified as um, infertile. Okay, okay, I understand. Um, so I think an important part of that is the time frame. Um, the time frame um, d uh, uh, definition, part of the definition. So um, say, for example, a young woman, uh, 18 years old, uh, you know, within a year has maybe two or three miscarriages. Would that, be, the, would that woman be classified as infertile? Does that apply in that sense? So not necessarily if we're going to look at the definition. So, okay. so, so the issue of recurrent miscarriages mm -hmm would be um, come in if we would want to say that if we're looking at infertility, the end product is to have a life better at the end of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, if you have had recurrent miscarriages, you don't necessarily have, you know, a life better at the end of it. Mm -hmm. In infertility, you should be in a position where you are failing to conceive. In miscarriages, you are able to conceive, but it's an mm -hmm. issue of sustaining the pregnancy. Okay. Therefore, we'll probably just have to say that the definition of infertility on its own mm -hmm. is limited because someone also has had recurrent miscarriages in the end product. Mm -hmm. They don't have a live child. They are more or less like someone else who has never conceived before because conceiving probably we would want to put it at the end that someone else has got a live birth. Mm -hmm. However, the causes of recurrent miscarriages are quite similar to the causes of infertility. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there's quite an interlink between, you know, recurrent miscarriages and infertility. Mm -hmm. However, if we're just looking at the definition of the two, then they're quite separate. But there's quite a good interlink between, between the two. Okay. Now, in the cultural context, um, you know, a woman who is infertile or is unable to bear children um, often experiences stigma, discrimination in her community. Um, I'll, I'll turn over now uh, to you, Helena, to just discuss a little bit, um, you know, in respect to your infertility advocacy, the work that you do. Um, just talk to us a little bit, a little bit about the um, the experiences women have with discrimination, stigmatization in in um, their uh, communities, and how that affects um, getting treatment or looking for alternative methods of conception. Right. So there's a number of things, mm -hmm. things that you don't talk about. First of all, um, you don't really get help. Mm. Um, 
And if you don't name it, you don't also distinguish what is fact and what is fiction mm -hmm. or, you know, things like that. So just starting the conversation in itself, I'm really happy that we are having this conversation because it's a conversation that I think is very long overdue in many households and in many communities. And when we talk about stigma, stigmatization, it, it emanates from different spring points. Mm. For some people, it will be cultural, the cultural context in which you grew up, um, the way people perceive the inability to conceive and how people are then treated. In some instances, you have um, people being excluded. So you will exclude me out of a conversation of children because mm. the assumption is, I don't know what that means or I can't relate to that conversation or um, certain cultural practices that will exclude me because the assumption is I'm not I'm unworthy mm. of participating in that. Then you have religious uh, stigmatization that comes from religious beliefs. Um, people that believe that it's either a curse, a godly curse, or, you know, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And that in itself plays itself out in different ways again. And people start treating you. Some will say you're demon possessed. Some will say, you know, all sorts of things that are really very, very far from reality. Mm -hmm. Then you have those that are influenced by um, education, just the lack thereof, the lack of understanding what fits where and things like that. So all those big grounds are breeding grounds that, that sort of promotes the issue of stigmatization. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people live in live very uncomfortable lives because other people make those them, their lives very uncomfortable for them. And simply because they are perceived or they are unable to bear children or bear children that are alive for that matter. Mm. So it's a really, really big issue. Sorry, did you say something, doctor? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I just wanted to say that in some instances, it even leads to violence, mm. you know, violence in the home because partners accuse each other, you know, it's your fault, it's your fault, or it becomes the issue of you are the bewitched one or you are the demon-possessed demon one or, you know, all kinds of, of unhealthy behaviors emanate from that as mm -hmm. well. So stigma at the moment, really, really big problem. And the best point to start, I think, is like with platforms like this, where we can really just talk about and unpack what is real about infertility and what is not. Yeah, and that's exactly um, what the Merck More Than a Mother um, Foundation and, and a movement actually does. It really aims to empower, um, you know, infertile women through access to information, education, and then changing that stigma. So I think both of you can weigh in on, on this question. When it comes to um, women themselves, you know, um, in the Namibian context, women themselves in a country where we don't talk much about infertility issues, we don't talk much about difficulties people have with conception. When um, a couple comes in or, uh, uh, Ms. Helena, any couple that you've worked with or any woman that you've worked with, what are generally um, the biggest misconceptions the couples have themselves and um, what are the things that they struggle the most to understand and process when it comes to the subject area? Uh, I'm going to weigh in there right really quickly, doctor, if you don't mind. And I'm not going to speak from a third person's perspective, but mm -hmm. I'm going to speak from my own perspective because I've lived or I've experienced the challenges of, of infertility for, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm in my, somewhere in my 40s. And so I've, it's something that I've, I have experienced since my 20s. So I understand all too well the challenges that journey brings mm -hmm. brings along. But I think some of the things that I really didn't understand when I was much younger were, first of all, how do you secure or how do you make sure that you preserve fertility? Mm -hmm. Because infertility is a result of, can be a result of some things. Mm -hmm. You might be born with it, you might not be born with it. And in the event that you're not born with it, it may come from certain things, whether you're aware or, or unaware of them. That's the first thing. The second thing for me was also just really not understanding and not having people speak about it open enough in a way that gave me permission mm. to speak about my, to speak my truth. People that would share their troubles or their journeys with me in a way that would make me feel comfortable about what that was. Mm. 
And I think for a long time in my 20s, particularly, I, I just I made up a lot of excuses because I was embarrassed. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't also know how to explain it to other people. So I think those are some of the things. And then, of course, as you if you don't make a conscious decision at some point to inform yourself so that you begin to understand the medical influence, you understand the social influence and all these things, you can live in a state of total it's not bliss, <laughs> just total ignorance. Mm. And that ignorance can bring you a lot more pain than you need. Um, so for me, that was my personal journey. And I think at some point I started realizing, but this is kind of pointless. I need to deal with this, the reality of this issue. Mm. And then also look at what are the options available for me to realize my desire of becoming a mother. Before we get into the options, uh, which is something we'll, we'll definitely discuss as well, uh, Dr. Ndobi, could you weigh in a little bit on what your experience has been with couples and um, the challenges that they face when they learn about um, the infertility issues that they're facing? Yeah, I think one of the quite common uh, misconceptions is the fact that um, we people believe that uh, infertility is female-centered. They don't, mm, that's uh, a good point. You know, understand that male factor is is as common as female factor when it comes to infertility. So, if we're looking at just in terms of percentages uh, that contribute towards infertility, it's mm. almost 50 50. Mm. 30 percent of the causes of infertility are in the female and 30% are in the male side. So you, a lot of people don't understand that. And you can actually see that the pressure, as Helena said, is pushed more to women. When we, 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 we also know that male factor is as common as female factor. And that and so on has actually put a lot of pressure on women in terms of health seeking behavior and the support that they have to get even from, from, from the communities, because, you know, males are being neglected in a sense, and they think that it's not a problem on their mm -hmm. side. But in actual fact, it is. And, and, and conversations like this are actually opening up to a lot of women to, to understand that they may not have the problem. The problem could be on the male side. And in actual fact, if both of you come together uh, when you're seeking for medical help, it will actually make things a little bit more quicker because mm. investigations can be done on both sides. Uh, in the end, we are able to pick out where the problem is and try to address the problem. In the end, then you get the correct treatment. Mm. So I think the issue of thinking that infertility is only um, uh, caused by females, it's, 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 it's not true. Uh, male factor is quite common as well. Mm. And that's a very good point you make there, because even in um, the few discussions that we do have, we center the conversation very around, much around yeah, the woman. Yeah. Um, and uh, Dr. Ndovi, in your experience, what usually happens? Is it that a couple will come in and both of them will put themselves forward to say, we want to find out what's going on on both sides? Or is it generally the case that a couple will come in and the conversation just centers on what is wrong with me as the woman? Why can I not have a child? What is what is the my common occurrence? Yeah, yeah. My, 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 my experience has actually been that I see a lot of women that come in uh, to seek the, the, the medical help. Mm. And they will present with problems like um, I've been having prolonged bleeding, for example. Mm. I've been having severe pain during my menstrual cycle. Um, and when you go deeper into that, that's when they'll tell you, but you know what, we've also been trying to, to conceive um, for a long time. Now. Um, so the issue of conceiving will probably pop up as, you know, as a secondary issue because they would not freely open up to you to say, mm. this is what they want. However, we tend to see now that some women are able to open up clearly and say, listen, we've been together with my partner for more than two years now, and we are trying to conceive, and things are not working out. Mm. Uh, we need to, to be helped. But those are very few that would actually come in mm. with their partner along. Most of the times, it's women that would, would come in. Mm. And I feel that probably it's this notion that 
we're pushing at times that males are probably okay. Mm. But if we can drive the notion to say that both parties should come together when it is an issue of wanting to conceive, then both should actually come in mm. for us to, to do the, the, the assessment. But my experience has been that it's the women that would want to push for help first mm. than the men. Mm. I want to just slot in there really quickly, um, Doctor, because I think you make a valid point in... I think also it's because generally society will place the pressure of, you know, conceiving or childbearing on the woman. When mm. you get married, even if you look at our cultural practices, how you're being prepared for your matrimonial home and things like that. You know, in some cultures, the expectation is within a year, you must pay back the dress in a way, mm. <laughs> you know. So the, the, the pressure is certainly a lot more on women to conceive. And also because when women do or don't conceive, it's a physical exhibition of whether that has happened or not. Yeah. Whilst for men, it can be that the problem is there, but, you know, it will really take medical investigation to establish the ability to conceive or not. While with women, if you've seen me for the last 10, 15, 20 years, you start to wonder, but, you know, what's kind of going on with you you should have by now had you know things like that so I think that that also plays some sort of role mm. in why we ultimately assume that women or why we ultimately take the position that women are to blame mm. for infertility issues when in fact uh, we know that that is really not the case yes absolutely yeah. I was actually just going to um, mention that you know, with men, if a man doesn't have a child, even if he's married for a number number of years, nobody's walking around thinking about, like, is this man's sperm count okay? Nobody's thinking that. They're just thinking about the wife mm -hmm. and why she is not having a child in, you know, the prescribed time frame. Mm -hmm. um, but, Helena, if you don't mind sharing with us a little bit about your own experience, um, because I know that uh, a video that you did for the Merck More Than a Mother um, heroin um, series you spoke about it and also just talked about um, how your husband factored into that and how um, certain actions from your husband made you feel um, in terms of you know like uh, I think there was one point where you mentioned him paying for um, certain consultations um, and then feeling like th that didn't necessarily make you feel good because it felt like he was taking ownership of the problem but not quite supporting you in, in that. Okay. If you could speak on that. So, a yeah, bit. sure. I'm happy to speak on that. But I think just the f uh, one or two things that I want to uh, uh, correct. Mm. Um, the issue of infertility. So in my journey of infertility, mm. It started off with not really understanding and not understanding is not a good place because you can end up making all kinds of assumptions yeah. and all kinds of errors. So it's really good to always get yourself informed as much as you can yeah. so that you understand what options are available. I was married for quite a while and in my marriage we struggled to conceive. Now, I don't think that my husband didn't necessarily support me, or my ex-husband in this instance, mm -hmm. didn't necessarily support me. I just think that it was a, a case where we both didn't know enough. So that's already a bad place to be in mm -hmm. because if you don't understand enough, and mind you, my, my ex-husband did have a child before we got married, so that might have seemed that that the fertility issue may not have been on his end, but on my end. Mm. At least that was that was what our assumption was at the time. So I think because you don't understand enough, if you don't understand what your issues are, it's also difficult to get the right kind of support mm. for those issues because you struggle to articulate what it is that you need and how you need to be supported and all of that. Of course, this is not the case for everybody, but I think in my particular case, we just didn't understand enough. Mm. Uh, and because we didn't collectively seek um, medical intervention, mm. that didn't help much either. Uh, had we just gone as a couple to a doctor and we collectively sort of pursued uh, what options were available, I think maybe we would have been able to, to support one another differently in that mm. case. But that might not be the case with some other people, yeah. right? So for me, it was the issue of it. I was struggling to conceive. I, I couldn't understand. I wasn't falling pregnant. Started um, medical investigation and, you know, you do the laparoscopies and the laparotomies and all the, all the procedures that you can think of because you kind of get desperate after a while. And being desperate is a really bad place because 
when you become desperate, you also, the way you conduct yourself makes it difficult for people to come in because you go into this victim mode, mm -hmm. you go into this people don't understand what I'm going through mode, and that also makes it difficult for people to kind of come into that situation. So anyway, we, we did that a couple of years. We tried the assisted um, assisted conception, if you want to put it that way. We didn't go as far as uh, IVF, but we ended up with um, artificial insemination, I think is as far as we went. But over time, that and many other reasons just sort of broke down that marriage to the extent that it didn't make any logical sense to proceed and pursue these these other alternatives mm -hmm. so i left that oh we, we we separated in that instance and after that was really when i started learning about infertility mm -hmm. and what what are really my issue what are really at the at the core of my issues and more importantly what are the treatment options that are available and what mm -hmm. options should I now be considering that could be suitable for me? So I think um, that that's probably for some couples it is we don't understand enough. We don't know. We don't know enough to know what to do. Mm -hmm. We don't know people who know what to do. Yeah. Uh, and and it's, it, it's not necessarily always an issue of you know, um, your partner doesn't, and I think women very often when you speak to women, we always take, tend to take that position. Mm. There are couples where you will find that the men take lead in those kind of conversations because maybe producing an heir or whatever is really important to them. So they kind of take lead in that conversation. So I'm just trying to balance that conversation in a sense mm. that, yes, the, we, we, we might find ourselves in that issue, but we also need to understand and articulate ourselves and communicate our experience to our partners in such a way that they understand where do they come in. Sometimes women will tell you when they pray or men will tell you when their wives are pregnant. I don't know what to do because like today it's this to tomorrow is that because sometimes we just we, we don't articulate well yeah. what level of support do we want so that it gives them the opportunity to also understand how to support you. Yeah. And I certainly think that was probably w how my situation was. But I think for some other people, it might not be the case. It might really be a case where your partner is just, you're on your own. Mm. So because I was starting to feel sorry for myself at some point, I owned the mm. problem. Okay. Without the problem being investigated, I owned the problem. I made it my problem. Mm. I started th feeling like, okay, I've got to find a way to have a baby. This means I must start saving money because it, it, it didn't even become a, we have to find a way to, mm. because I just owned the problem and the problem became mine. Mm. And it wasn't necessarily because he refused to own the problem with me. It was because I just got into this little cocoon where mm. I thought, oh, I'm so unworthy. Oh, what a problem. Oh, this, oh, that, oh, that. And that's really a really bad place to be yeah. for anyone. Yeah, yeah. no, so. understandably so. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to you in terms of what options you explored. But before we do that, um, Dr. Ndobi, can you tell us actually what are um, the fertility treatments that are around? Um, I know, you know, commonly IVF in vitro fer uh, fertilization. Uh, you mentioned artificial insemination. If you could just talk us through the various um, um, uh, treatments that are available. Right. So um, I think to understand what treatments are available, it's also important to understand that there are different stages when it mm. comes to, to pregnancy. Mm. So if one has to conceive, there are various stages that have one has to go through. And if we understand that, then we'll be able to uh, also target or understand why certain things are being done. Mm. And actually, they're part of your treatment for mm. infertility. It may not necessarily be IVF, mm. but probably True. you will go for an operation to have a fibroid removed mm. because we believe that is causing a problem. Mm. So for one to four pregnant, you at least have to have, you know, an egg that is being produced from the ovary on the female side at least once a month. And then the man has should, should be able to produce semen of a good quality that will be able to meet with the egg and to fertilize. 
And when fertilization has happened, you know, that fertilized egg should be able to move and implant into the uterus. So all these four stages should be available and, you know, conducive for, for the pregnancy. Mm. If you're not able to ovulate, then you can be given medication to help you with the ovulation. So you hear that part of the treatment that probably the doctor gave me was tablets mm. that I had to take. That will probably help you to produce the eggs. And on the male side, you'll be given treatment to enhance the number of sperms that you require. And in some cases, you'll probably be given antibiotics because we know that probably the semen levels were low because there was an infection, for example. Mm. And this, that's the same even in women, that you'll be told that you need to get these tablets because we believe there is an infection. So part of it is the medical treatment that you get in the form of tablets, mm -hmm. and it may not be IVF. Then we move on to areas of operation. So if we do find that probably you've got an obstruction in the uterus. For example, you've got um, fibroids. Then the doctor would say, it is important that this be removed because it will affect you in terms of your conceiving. Mm -hmm. The same goes to, to, to the male side. We do find that some males would have a problem that we call varicocellus. So those have to be removed surgically for them to improve you know the level of the semen so you get an operation in line of that we know that some people would have what we call adhesions or the uterus would mm -hmm. have you know adhesions those have to be released and those will require an operation mm -hmm. and then we move on to what we call uh, assisted reproductive techniques mm -hmm. and in that group that's where we find things like IVF. So IVF targets, you know, to bypass, you know, the process that naturally happens in the uterus, and then we do that in the lab. So what we do is the woman is given medication and the eggs are produced, and then those will be harvested through a small operation, mm -hmm. and those eggs will actually be mixed together with the semen that we've collected. After a few days, that fertilization would happen, and that would then be transferred into the woman. Okay. And there have been new technologies that have actually now been developed to improve this IVF. Mm -hmm. So you'll be hearing people talking about ICSI. So this targets specific male partners who probably do not have enough sperm. Even one can be corrected, mm -hmm. and that will be injected directly into an egg and fertilization would happen and that will improve the chances of you know that fertilization process happening in those that have got reduced uh, sperm count mm. and then you move on to other things apart from IVF where you're talking about insemination so that insemination my understanding would be that we're looking at what we call in utero um, intrauterine um, um, insemination. So what we basically do is normally the woman is given tablets for about five days and then after 10 to 14 days we do a scan to try and see if at least one egg has devolved. And then we ask the male partner to submit semen in the lab and that semen is concentrated and put in a small tube and that is injected at the correct time when we know and understand that the woman is now ovulating and that is injected in and then we assume that at some point maybe in the next three 34 to 48 hours fertilization will then occur so this will probably be like a minor form of the ivf that is actually also also available mm. apart from those then we're talking about issues of surrogacy or you know, people being advised even to go for uh, for adoption mm -hmm. in cases where they can't even uh, conceive. But so to say that IVF has actually opened up a lot of opportunities for a lot of couples who thought they cannot conceive. Mm -hmm. However, it is a service that is not accessible to those that probably desperately, desperately need it. Mm -hmm. People in the rural areas that we are in, 
that actually actually need it. They may not be able to access it because of the issues of distance and also issues of finances because it's not as as cheap as you know it's very very expensive and most people uh, are not able to 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 afford mm. so those are the, the the treatment options that are available they're quite wide and they'll be targeted on what the problem is but however ivf seems to be the biggest group of it all but there are other things that could be done mm. and uh, dr ndovi on that point on um the costs um, how much do these treatments cost? If you can just give us ballparks for the various treatments that you mentioned, how much would it run someone to have such a treatment? I think the biggest cost that we, we, we're looking at here is to do with IVF. And probably that, that would be what a lot of people would be asking about. And IVF depends on each and every institution. Each and every institution will give you their own fee on what they, they believe would, it would cost. Mm. But just to put it in a bracket, IVF would cost you money for the doctor's treatment that you go for. Mm -hmm. So that will include, you know, when the consultations, the scans, and then taking you to theater for harvesting of the eggs and, you know, mixing in the lab and, you know, transferring the, the, the fertiles. That will have a cost on its own. Mm. And then there'll be a cost for the medication that you will require for you to have the eggs to grow. And that is the biggest chunk also of the cost because it's not automatically included mm. in the cost that you will pay to the institution. However, it will not cost, it will be more than 80,000 in most of the cases. And this is Namibian dollar. Mm. Um, if there will be any cheaper options, then probably I wouldn't know, but most of them would probably cost in, in those range. Okay, all right. Um, Helena, you could perhaps also speak on your experience, the treatments that, um, that you had. How much, how much did it cost? Mm. Before I go to the treatment costs, just mm. to slot into what doctor was talking about, I wanted to talk about the medical issue that mm. gave rise to struggling to conceive. Mm. And in my instance, it's, it's a condition called endometriosis, which yes. <laughs> a lot of women that, yeah experience but mm. we don't always understand and even those around us really don't understand so it makes it it makes it very complicated at times mm. and in the endometriosis without trying to be very medical i think dr Novo can go into the medical terminology in a nutshell is really the tissue lining of the womb that attaches itself outside the womb mm. and this causes some sort of ob obstruction for um, the sperm to get through to where it needs to get through mm. and so for me growing up it was always just the issue of oh i have difficult periods mm. crampy periods painful periods but i i growing up we didn't really understand that if we investigated those things we would understand that there are medical conditions that probably are likely to result in that so that's a condition that that um, I struggled with and it's not necessarily an, a condition that means that you're not going to be able to conceive because I do know people who have endometriosis but and who have conceived right and who have bear ch born children mm -hmm. so that's the one thing the second thing was that um, when it came to the the treatment my treatment wasn't exhaustive mm. uh, to Dr. Ndovi's point I think a lot of times um, we either don't do enough or we don't do anything at all. Mm. Like in my instance, I think I stopped with uh, artificial insemination and I didn't go beyond that point because I didn't feel that I, ne I, I wanted to go beyond that point. And the one thing that I needed to separate in my mind was was it an issue, and I think Dr. Ndove, when he introduced, when he started talking about infertility, he talked about the inability to conceive, mm. the ability to carry a full pregnancy and birth a life child. Mm. So for me, I needed to also ask myself, w was my issue really with the inability to conceive at the, at the age where I was now? Is it the inability to conceive? Is it the ability to carry a life child to full term? Or was my desire really simply to be a parent? Mm. Because if my desire was simply to be a parent, it didn't mean I needed to be pregnant. 
didn't mean I needed to give birth, mm -hmm. but I could still become a parent if that was really the outcome that I was looking for. So for me, that was ultimately where my journey led to. Mm -hmm. um, it took me down the path of adoption, which I'm really, really happy that I did because I, I think my love story really started, <laughs> like literally my, love, my life started mm -hmm. after that moment that I adopted my daughter. So I think also that's the one thing that I want to throw in the room there, uh, in this virtual room there, mm -hmm. for people that are struggling with conception, that you be clear. Um, is it an issue of I want to feel what it's like to be pregnant? I want to feel what a baby moving around in me is like, mm -hmm. or I want to know what a child looks like that has my features or whatever. And even if they have your features, they can still do surrogacy, right, doctor? Yeah. So it's not an issue of you can't see a child that has your genetic makeup. Mm -hmm. So you need to just be clear on, in that space and honest with yourself. And I think I got to a point where I was, okay, so I was divorced. I was in an age bracket where I was like, I struggled in my 20s. I'm not going to go struggle in my late 30s with mm -hmm. this, but I do want to be a mother. So how do I, how do I best realize that? And mm -hmm. the best way to realize it for me was the issue was obviously adoption. Mm -hmm. And it was less cost effective. Um, it, 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 it had less cost, but it was a customized solution for me. Mm. For other people, it might be any one of the treatment options that the doctor has shared. But the first point, obviously, is you've got to inform yourself. You've mm. got to understand what it is, what it's not. And then you've got to make your own sort of calculations. Yeah. If you look at the cost regimes, what is it that what, appet what financial appetite do you have to be able to realize what? Yeah. Um, yeah, do speak to us a little bit about the costs that you incurred yeah. and then also whether your medical aid assisted you in any way with that. Yeah, so that's a really sore thumb mm. in a way, I think, for people who struggle with conception because the bulk of the e treatments are not fully covered under medical insurance. Mm. Um, I know some of the medication is covered, but the bulk of it is not covered and then also when it comes to the consultations the medical consultations like mm -hmm. certain doctors consultation fees are above what the standard is so you've always got this top up that you need to mm -hmm. you need to make provision for the for the medical consultations like the doctor was saying you ne uh, need to then make provision for the medi for the tablets and the medication that you need to take and then you need to make provision for the procedures if there are procedures involved the post procedures and mm -hmm. you know it's, it, it can be costly i know for example of one of the ladies who shared at one platform where um, Merck, uh, a platform that was called together mm -hmm. by the Merck Foundation who shared that she actually, I think she said they sold their house, mm -hmm. they had to sell their house um, to conceive. And I just thought to myself how, how, how horrible that must be, the desire to want to realize wanting to be a parent so much that you need to actually get rid of your house in order to realize that. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question in a nutshell, medical insurances don't cover it enough. And medical insurances covering it is one issue. What about the broader majority who are not covered by medical insurance? Mm, yeah. um, so I think these conversations are important because we need to sort of um, spur on medical insurances, for example, to start thinking of creating packages that cover these kind of conditions. Mm -hmm. And you also need to start conversations amongst ourselves and with our lawmakers in terms of how do we then assist those who are not covered by medical insurances also to be able to access um, at least a, a certain level yeah. of treatment when it comes to these things. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that even with um, medical facilities, we, ha we have few, we have two in the whole country based yeah. in Vintuk. Um, so also, Dr. Ndovi, to your point of access, you know, the people who need it the most do not even have access to the facilities um, and then more likely the funds as well. Um, so just um, to round off as we're getting close to um, the end of our discussion, um, if we can just get some final um, points from the doctor and from Helena. Um, doctor, if you can just, um, you know, just give Nam the Namibian nation a little bit of commentary on um, accessing um, 
destigmatizing the whole the whole subject area um, and just the most important points of what we need to know and understand when it comes to um, conception and difficulties thereof. Yep, no, thank you. I think a few things that I would want to, to, to highlight and I think as part of the ongoing um, conversation, I'm very glad that uh, I had to take part in this. It's, it's an issue of trying to reach out as many people as we can with the information that we, we have. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to acknowledge the fact that um, Meg Foundation through the First Lady's Office is really trying to improve this by, you know, training media houses in terms of infertility and so on. That's the, that's the way to go, where people have to access the correct information. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the cultural issues. We, we live in, in a society where our, our culture and, and the people that are around us influence so much on what we do. And most of these issues that we're struggling with in terms of the cultural pressures that have been put on women is because mm. of the misconception and the lack of information that people need to know. And these conversations that we're having and the information that, you know, media houses like yourselves can spread out is very, very crucial for people to know what are the important things when it comes Infertility. Mm. infertility is not a case. Infertility is a medical condition and people need to come to a point where they say we need to go and seek medical help mm. and you will get help and in, in the areas that probably we can manage because here we need to be honest that we've talked about the availability of IVF. It's not to everyone. Mm. But if you go to centers and, for example, if you've been struggling with fibroids and you're lucky enough that you've been operated, your chances of conceiving probably will be much higher. Mm. If people found out that you had endometriosis and you're being treated, and probably that's the treatment that you need. For example, if you had issues with, you know, low sperm count and mm. you're being treated for that, you probably not necessarily need IVF because mm. there's certain things that can be done. So that is all about information that we can give to people so that they can understand what sort of things they should be able to to get. Mm. And my plea is to, to the community at large that when it comes to issues of infertility, of course there's so many misconceptions and so many myths around. Mm. It is important that we do understand the truth about it. It is a medical condition yeah. that can be treated in most of the cases. When it comes to the issues of our treatment, and I would really want to you know, us to try and try and push and push for it to make it more accessible to as many people as possible. Mm. Whether it's IVF, whether it's issues about, you know, doing the correct operation for what problem, what medications do we need to make available to giving people in the rural areas. Mm. Those are some of the things that we need to be driving at. And one of the things that probably we forget on is there certain things that are to do with our lifestyle modifications that we need to adjust. Mm -hmm. Things about smoking, weight loss, you know, exercising, S simple things like those. Those are some of the things that people need also to try and understand, you know, that they could help them in trying to improve their chances of conceiving. Mm -hmm. So my plea would be probably that let's continue these discussions that we are having. And, and I'm glad that, you know, just this week, from last week and this week, you guys have been pushing issues of infertility and it really touches my heart that we can go out there and talk about it. You know, people will always continue to talk about this. So let's continue doing this and it will reach as many people as possible. And people need to unveil themselves, talk about what their issues are, then they'll get help. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Ndovi. Helena, I'll give you a final word as well. Anything that you'd like to add to the conversation? Yeah, no, I, I want to agree with what Dr. Ndovi is saying, that this conversation has got to be rolled out everywhere. We've got to normalize this conversation. Mm. We've got to allow people, we've got to talk about it so much that people feel comfortable to talk about it, mm. whether they are the ones experiencing it or not experiencing, but it's got to become a normal part of our conversation so that we can take away the sa shame and the stigma and all these mm. other undesirable things that come with it. But I think also we need to... Um, we need to normalize the conversation and we need to close the information gap. Mm. People need to get informed. 
Um, so platforms like this, to Dr. Ndove's point, is really, really important. And platforms like the Merck Foundation is really, really important because they create you create these platforms and these opportunities that say to people, it's okay, mm -hmm. let's talk about this and let's see what we can do and help each other sort this thing out. And then also um, the people that really, really need to pick up this conversation, I think a little bit more with a sense of urgency, mm -hmm. are particularly people that are like pastors. In, their church, in churches, people need to talk about this and normalize the conversation mm. without over-spiritualizing the conversation and making it difficult for people to come and share these kind of things. Mm. We also need to talk about these things in, in educational institutions so that we can begin to orient ourselves towards thinking academically, how do we unpack these things, what kind of mm -hmm. solutions, how do we adjust legislation, how do we do all these other things that we need to do. And then lastly, I think the thing that I just want to leave is for anyone that I've ever spoken to who struggled with infert uh, infertility, mm -hmm. it comes with the extremely heavy emotional baggage yeah. and it comes with a and it, sometimes it comes with mental issues as well because you've constantly got to mitigate your mental state so that you make sure that you don't lose your mind over certain things mm -hmm. so these are things that are real and if we if we isolate issues they escalate into other issues like we were talking about earlier violence at home things like mm -hmm. that so this thing is normalize the conversation and keep doing what you're doing because you're doing a good job. Doctor, keep doing what you're doing because you're doing a good job. <laughs> and then I guess, for, yeah, we will, we will also always just share our story because, I mean, what have I got to lose if somebody in their 20s can learn from me in my 40s, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Helena, for uh, your contributions and sharing your experience with us. It's very much appreciated. Yeah. And I mean, as you said, this is just the beginning of a conversation on a subject that we have um, not broached as a nation, but now are beginning to talk about more openly, filling those information gaps, creating access to information and educating people on the subject area. Um, you know, it's a conversation that we'll keep having. And um, for those viewers who joined us this evening thank you so much for tuning into heartbeat feel free to leave any comments um, at the bottom for um, follow-up questions for both helena uh, dr ndovi and we will pass that along to you um, from us here at the namibian i'm arlana shikongo and thank you for joining us